Right, so let's have a look at some uh, malware creation and detection. So we'll have a look at how uh, a malware can be created with inside a Metasploit and then how we're able to detect the usage of the, the Metasploit uh, malware. Okay, so here's two typical methods that might be used in the propagation of malware. So often there's a, a jump off point on the network which a machine is compromised and then that's used to jump onto things like file servers and domain servers and, and so on. Two typical methods is through a phishing email. So this might be Flash, Java or PDF contained within a side of phishing email and if the user hasn't uh, actually updated or patch their system for those, then the machine can be compromised, provides an anchor point uh, which allows some malware to be downloaded onto the machine and then it's compromised. Another way is where an intruder might seed some uh, a backdoor into uh, an application such as with inside Pirate Bay or a peer-to-peer -peer type uh, uh, BitTorrent type network. Okay, and this, this can affect many types of computers, uh, Windows, Apple Mac and so on, where would the user will download uh, Office or Photoshop uh, and with inside it the executables are, are corrupted with a backdoor. Then what happens, typically happens, is there's a callback from the node that is compromised and uh, that callback goes back to the intruder machine. The intruder machine can then connect into the anchor point and then again that's used as a jump off point okay so if you recall it was quite difficult to really classify our different types of malware uh, but we're going to look at uh, backdoor types uh, where there is a backdoor installed onto an application uh, it certainly exploits something to do with the operating system and you could say it might even be a trojan horse so it's quite difficult to really properly define our, our malware into any of these classifications that typically several will work at the at the same time altogether. Okay, this is our basic taxonomy. We had a classification. There's a certain distribution method that happens. Okay, it could be a a, a bit torrent type network or it could be a phishing email. Then there's some observational uh, events around this distribution and then and then some sort of system compromise it stays persistent and then it is then triggered by something as we'll see just by running a program might be a trigger event here and then it has some observable attack methods does some damage uh, for certain objectives okay as we've seen before a traditional method uh, of analyzing our malware is our static analysis and it's very important that we still do that. So the static analysis gives us uh, uh, strings, hex values that we're really looking for, allows us to capture a signature for our malware and even allows us to be able to see uh, bits of code with inside or at least text with inside uh, the executable. Increasingly though, what we do is we actually run the malware to see what it's actually doing, which files does it touch, uh, what is it doing the registry, what's it doing on the network and so on. And we're using tools such as Snort and Wireshark to be able to do that. Also, we can monitor processes and threads and so on. And very much we're looking to uh, create some sort of tripwire which allows us to be able to see the different hashes so that we can see that our, our file has actually changed. Okay, and then what we want to do is to be able to look and see what our malware looks like, say with inside an email message. This is a base64 format, and if we wanted to capture uh, this as a payload, we'd often have to take a little signature here and then add that into our snort signature. In that way, the converted zip file in this case is converted to our base64. The base64 would take a, a snapshot of it and then, and then that, that allows us to, to convert it into into the snort signature. Okay, so how is the malware created with Metasploit? 
Okay, so what we have is we have MSS Venom, and the MSS Venom allows us to take, uh, in this case, the uh, the payload here, which is uh, the, the meterpreter reverse TCP payload. And then we define a, a callback address on a certain port. And then this is the code here, which is then injected into the, uh, the EXE that allows the actual uh, additional code to be, to, to be run when the executable is run. So in this case, we're taking uh, putty and we'll put it into putty X. That's our, that's our, our malware here that's been created. So the actual, uh, the actual uh, method that we use here uh, to be able to get the, the script is with a, a reverse, in this case, the reverse TCP shell, which is a, a Ruby script. Okay, so there's a Ruby script has uh, various uh, parameters that, that that we set. So we can see here it's a it's a Windows type architecture, an Intel x86. There's the platform is Windows, uh, and we have certain defaults like the local host and the local port, and so on. You can see here here is the the payload that must be delivered with inside the exe for it to work. Okay, so it's this command PowerShell which will insert the additional code that will actually make this code actually run actually on the, the system. Okay, so if we just have a little look and uh, we'll see if we can actually find our, our scripts. Okay, so here's our Kali instance here and we'll set up a, a lab for you to have a look at. And uh, the folder that we're actually looking for is this folder here. So what we'll do is we'll go to our payload folder. Let's see if we can just paste that in. Okay, so here are our payloads. Okay, so... Uh, we want our stagers. Okay, so we have different operating systems. So we'll have a look at our Windows. And then we have a Ruby script here. So we're using the reverse TCP Ruby script. And that is there. Okay, so this is what the script actually looks like that we've just been looking at. And there's the there's the payload that we can actually see here. This is the payload that's actually going to be uh, added to the executable, and it's obviously done through the the actual uh, command there. Okay, so what we'll do is that uh, we'll have a look at uh, how this is actually added. So the first thing we'll do is that uh, we'll actually copy over uh, a, an executable from Windows. So here we are. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll copy over calc. Let's copy over calc. And see if we can set that one up. Let me get logged in. Okay. So there we go. And what we're looking for is calc.exe. So let's try and find it first. Probably in system 32, I would think. And there. And there it's there. Okay, so on system 32. System 32. What we'll do is we'll, we'll copy calc.exe into, uh, we're running a web server, so we'll copy it into them. Okay, so calc is now, that's a standard, so just to make sure that uh, we know where we are. So there's our init pub, there's a root, and there's a file called calc. Okay, just as a calculator. So that is 115k. 
So what we'll do is we'll come over here now and what we'll do is we'll just download calc. So 10 to 100 and the IP address of Windows is One six three and a slash calc dot exe. Okay, so there we are. And what we'll do is we'll just put that into the home folder. It just makes it easier for us to, to deal with. Okay, so just have a look that it's there. Just have a look to see if it's the right size. Okay, that looks great. So now what we'll do is that uh, we'll just run our MSF Venom here. Paste that in. Nope. Let's copy it again. Okay, there and copy. Okay, so our Kali node, I think this one here is at 10200.0.88. We're going to use port 443. There's a PowerShell code that's going to uh, invoke the reverse meterpreter shell. And we're taking calc and we're calling it calc x. Okay, and it just takes a little minute. It's going to do three iterations uh, of this and try to, to optimize the executable. Okay, so it should be by default that it should go to Windows and x86 architecture. And what we're going to do, that's it. Okay, so let's have a look at our calc. Okay, let's put on a little bit of weight, about 40k uh, in there. So what we'll do is that uh, we'll copy it into our, our var www. Oh, that, okay, so there's our that's in the, the web on the web server on the machine. And then we'll come over here and we'll just load up. And we'll run it first just to make sure that everything is okay. So it's uh, 10 288 and it's uh, calc x.exe. Okay, there we go. So we'll just give it a quick run just to see if it's running okay and that we haven't corrupted it in any way. Okay, so there we go. Okay, so calc is working fine. So now what we'll do is we'll start up a Metasploit and we'll just wait for the dial back on it okay so just let me quickly set this up okay so let me just get our notepad up okay so we want that we want that we don't want that we want that our Kali machine is at 10200.0.88 and that's fine and we're going to use 443 and that's it there. Okay, so these are our commands. We'll just copy these and we'll just paste them in. And what I should have done was to... What I should have done was to start uh, Metasploit. So we just started that up. Okay, so what we're going to do now is that we're going to uh, open up 
our calc in our Windows machine. And then we're going to watch what happens on our Metasploit machine. Okay, so let's just get ready over here. And there it's there. It's called CalcX. It's a bit bigger than it was before. Uh, so you should always really check the hash signature of, a, of an executable or any DLLs to make sure if they're not coming from a trusted site. So you can see there that's a lot bigger than the actual uh, calc on the system. Okay, so let's uh, go ahead and get that please. Oops. Let's try again. Okay, so that's awaiting. So now when we run CalcX, it's here. Okay, there's our CalcX. <laughs> okay, so this is working fine over here. Everything is great. But over here, we can actually see that we have a meterpreter shell on the machine. There we go. Okay, so there's all the, the commands that we've got. So get user ID. It's obviously one that we use. There's the SID for it. Uh, and we can do the normal types of, of commands from here. There's our ifconfig. Okay. And so on. So because we're the... We can actually move around. There we go. There's the top level from there. And we're the system administrator, so we should be able to do a, a hash dump. And th there we are. Okay, so you can see the the user would never know uh, that uh, this was actually running here. So what we want to be able to do is to be able to detect uh, the this in operation, so that we can actually analyze the uh, network traffic and also its uh, basic operation. So if we go and have a little look at our executable. So what we'll do is we'll just open up our calcx. In fact, we'll open up, uh, I've got an opad one here. And uh, just let me disable this. Okay, so this is a this is an example here. So in this case, I've taken Notepad and then I've added in the uh, the exploit. So what we want to be able to see if we can actually find the actual code that was injected in there. Okay, so we'll just exit from there now. Okay, and let's see if we can go back to the place where we were before, which is there. Okay, and there's our stagers. Okay, so let's look for a reverse TCP and there it's there. 
Okay, so the hex signature that we're looking for is let's go that for them. Okay, so we can do an, uh, so it's F C E eight eight two zero 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 and there's them. Okay, so that should match up exactly with this payload here. So this is where it's actually been inserted into the into the code. So really what happens is that uh, there's an extra little bit of code that, that runs with inside the PowerShell that allows, in this case, a little thread to run. So this is a thread, and then the thread that's run is this uh, this shell code here uh, for the for the exploit. Okay, and so what we really need to do is to be able to detect this with inside our binary files or on the network uh, and, and so on. Have a look to see if we can see how the that shell code, hexadecimal shell code, was that is actually injected into the system. So we're looking in modules. And we're looking for our encoders. That's an encoder. It's minus E option. Then it's CMD, and then it's PowerShell. Okay, so we'll just have a look at PowerShell to see how this is working. There's a Ruby script. Okay, so it's uh, Windows, it's uh, our Windows architecture. We're going to encode our our malware here, and how it's done is with a PowerShell. So basically, it runs PowerShell, it's hidden, and then it runs it with a base sixty four uh, string. Okay, so here's the here's our PowerShell here. Typical way of running sort of. Uh, uh, programs remotely and on the, the the machine, and we can see here the encoded format except a B sixty four encoded string, the version of the command. Okay, so it's this one here that we're actually using. We take our our malware, we package it up into a B sixty four string to be able to run as a as a, a an ex, as a as a B sixty four. Uh, string encoded string actually on the system. Okay, so really that's that's what we're actually doing. So you should see there's a there's a conversion in there for to take our our code and then convert it into there. There's our encoding from our command here. So then we're running a, a command on the system to take our Unicode and then actually convert it into B64. Okay, so command just opens up a command like that. It's command slash C. Let's look at that. Okay, so uh, this one carries out the command specified by a string and we can see the options there that we have with inside our command there. Okay, so that's the way that it actually is able to get a hook onto the system. Okay, so we've given an overview of uh, of how malware is created and then how we can actually analyze it. Then uh, what you want to do in the lab is then to be able to set up our snort sensors from uh, from the payload. So you should be able to find the the actual signature and then uh, look at snort and to be able to detect snort from there. Okay, so that's the malware creation and detection.